Well, we're going to continue our series. I feel like it's been forever since I've been here on a Wednesday night. So this is great. Fantastic. So we're going to uh, talk about 1 Timothy tonight. 1 Timothy. Before I do, I want to let everybody know that we are right in the middle of uh, signing people up for 242 groups. 242 is our home fellowship ministry. 242 comes from Acts 242 which is the passage that talks about what the church devoted themselves to. And, uh, and that's fellowship, the breaking of bread, the apostles' doctrine, uh, communion, prayer. And, uh, and so, so uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, what's your church like? Or how many people go to your church? Or tell me about your church. And usually we tend to think of Sunday morning, right, when that happens. But really, the church is, I think, the people that meet together throughout the week and fellowship and pray and study the Bible. And, and so this is really important, especially, you know, for those that live in countries where you can't gather publicly because it's illegal or whatever re the reason might be. And so I want to encourage you, if you're not in a 242 group or something similar, take the time and sign up. And, uh, and we have another week or so of signing folks up, and uh, it's just so important especially to meet people, get to know people, open your heart and life up to people. All right, so we are in a First Timothy as we are going through the Bible book by book, taking an overview look at each book of the Bible. And, uh, and it's exciting to be this far along in the scriptures. And um, it's such a great thing to think about. Why is this book in the Bible? So, you know, we, many of us have our favorite verses, our favorite passages. But whenever you read a passage in the Bible, I was, why is this in the Bible? And then look for those threads that were the, the original hearers had to deal with. And then what do we have in common with, with those people? But uh, So 1 Timothy, uh, I've entitled this message and the overview of this book, The Man and the Ministry. The Man and the Ministry. Uh, and so let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to bless our time here in his word. Father, we, we're grateful to be here, Lord. We're grateful to have the freedom to sit in a place and open up the Bible and talk about things that really matter in life. Lord, it's fun to think about sports or movies and these type of things, but but in the end, what really matters is our relationship with you. And we know that we're just on a journey, Lord, that this life is not all that there is, that this life is, is not going to be our eternal existence, that we are not trapped in these bodies or in this existence. And for that, we say a hearty thank you, Lord. But we know that you are using this time and you are preparing us. You're teaching us many things. You're, you're developing who we are because we know that we will exist forever we will live with you forever we know that there's a battle raging for the souls of men and we know that that you want to use us to reach others lord for you and uh and we want to grow lord we want to grow we want to say goodbye to sinful habits lord and uh, and we want to move into a place of maturity and strength and, uh, and, and really walking, walking with you. And so I pray as we look at your word today that our hearts would be open, uh, that we would uh, listen, Lord, with maybe pen in hand and a notebook or writing in our Bibles or taking notes on our phone or tablets or something, just that we could just really hear what your spirit would say. And Lord, would you just write these truths on our heart? Lord, we love you. We want to honor you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. To accomplish anything of substance in the world today, you need a team. Uh, Lord, we pray wherever those sirens are going, pray that your spirit would be there and you'd help anyone that's hurt. Uh, Lord, I pray nobody would slip into eternity without knowing you. Protect our police officers, Lord. To accomplish anything worthwhile, you need a team. You need help. You, need, you, you can do more together than alone. And the Apostle Paul, as he was called to share the love of God 
uh, to share the love of Jesus with many people and to start churches, he did it with a team. He had people helping him. Uh, his primary team member was a man named Barnabas. If you've read the book of Acts, you uh, have met Barnabas. Uh, I love Barnabas, the son of encouragement. We all need an encourager in our lives, and we all need to be an encourager. Uh, Barnabas had a nephew, John Mark. You remember John Mark? Uh, John Mark went along with Paul. So he had Paul and, and John Mark and Barnabas, and, and they're going out. There may have been others. We don't know. Uh, and then on that first missionary journey, we don't know exactly why, but John Mark left. John Mark uh, abandoned, abandoned the team. The Bible doesn't really tell us. We could, we could suppose. I have different theories, but, uh, but he quit. And this, this stung Paul. And uh, when that trip was over, sometime later, Paul and Barnabas decided to go back to all those churches that they started and minister again to, to encourage them, to strengthen them. Uh, and, uh, and Barnabas says, great idea, Paul. Let's take John Mark with us. And Paul says, oh, no. We're not taking that loser. No, I don't think he called him a loser. But it's interesting. You even look in that, in that passage. Paul wouldn't even say his name. He's like, we're not going to take the one who abandoned us, the one who quit on us. We're not taking him again. And Barnabas like, come on, Paul. Everybody needs a second chance. I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that, that we, can, we can pour into him and use him and, and be a blessing to him. And, and, and uh, I see a future in him. God's going to use him someday. And, uh, and so this, I think, went on for a little bit. And it, the Bible tells us that the division between Paul and Barnabas got so strong that they divided company. They, they departed ways. Paul went one way. Barnabas went another way. Barnabas took John Mark with him. And they went out one way. And Paul, the Bible says, this is in uh, Acts chapter 15, uh, it says that Paul chose Silas and, and went the other way. There's a lot you could say about that story. I love the story that's in the, that story that's in the Bible. Um, uh, you see, Barnabas was looking at what the man could do for the, or what God could do in John Mark. And Paul was looking at what John Mark could do for God, for the ministry. So Barnabas was more concerned about the work going on in John Mark. Paul wanted to know what could John Mark do for the ministry, for God. And they're both, they're both great perspectives, but different people have uh, different strengths in this. Okay, so here's Paul now. He's leaving with Silas, and the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 16 that, that he went to this uh, ancient city in the south. Uh, the southern countryside of Asia Minor, uh, near Clystra, Turkey, and it's a city that the Bible calls Lystra. Lystra. And as Paul and Silas are there, the believers there in Lystra said, hey, Paul, you gotta meet Timothy. You gotta meet this young man who's just on fire for the Lord. He loves Jesus. He, he loves he loves the scriptures. He knows the scriptures. You got to meet Timothy. And, and Paul, maybe you want to think about taking Timothy with him. And we don't know exactly how that looked out. But Paul is impressed with this young man, Timothy. Timothy was a third generation Christian. In a, if you're there in 1 Timothy, flip over just a few pages to 2 Timothy. And uh, look at verse 5 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. It says, when I call to remembrance, first, or 2 Timothy 1, 5, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Timothy was strongly influenced by the faith of Lois, his grandma. And I'm going to guess that there are many Loises here tonight, many grandmothers. And don't underestimate the influence you can and should have in your grandchildren. I want to say that again. It's very important. Don't underestimate the influence that you can have 
in your grandchildren. You may never live to see what happens in their life because of you. Obviously, this goes for parents as well, because in this verse, his, his grandmother and his mother, Lois and Eunice, are mentioned. And it's interesting, it's the ladies. It's not the grandfather and the dad, but it's the grandmother and the mom. I uh, heard a story recently. Um, I was actually praying with somebody after one of our services on Sunday. And they were telling me about how their child, their adult child, doesn't really walk with the Lord. They, they're a bit put off by Christians and Christianity. And, uh, and this person identified a situation, because they grew up Christian, but this young man in youth group, he sat on a chair, and the chair was a little rickety, and the chair fell. And everybody laughed at him. And, and the, the youth pastor uh, joined a bit in the laughter. It, I guess it was a bit humorous in the youth. And that situation stayed with that young man to this day over 20 years later he still is hurt by something that happened that one incident has kept him from the church you don't understand the power of your actions that's a negative example but there's many positive examples even if you just pray for a meal if you uh write your granddaughter or your daughter or your son or your grandson, you write them a card and you mention the Lord, you mention Jesus, you give them, you give them a track. You know, th this, goes, this can go on and on and on, but all of these actions, all of the things that you can do in their lives could be what they remember when they're 30, 40 years old and they say, I know God is with me because Nana or Papa gave me a little booklet one time that said God loves you. And you might say, I don't even remember doing that. I say, well, you did it. And they've remembered it for 30, 40 years. And now they're walking with the Lord because of that little, you know, $1 action. So don't, uh, don't ever underestimate that. When I was in college at the University of Miami, I went to, um, I was living on campus in the dorms there. And one day I, I checked my little mailbox and there's a little slip that I had a package and, uh, and so I'm like, oh, cool. Who doesn't like packages when you're in college, right? Was it cookies or popcorn or what it was? And, uh, and so I took the little package to the front desk there, or I took the slip to the front desk, and they gave me this, you know, rather sizable, not real big, but a rather sizable box. And it was heavy. And it was from a, a relative I had hardly had any contact with, my Aunt Dorothy from California, I believe it was. And I took that back to my room, and I opened it up, and there were four books big books, thick hardcover books in there. There was a Bible commentary. There was a Bible almanac. Uh, there was another book I don't remember. And then there was a book which has become my favorite Bible study book. It's called Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. And I opened all of those books up and in my grandmother's handwriting was to any male descendant of Philip and Eva Seeler, which are my grandparents. See, my grandmother had passed away, and my aunt, who was the executor of her estate, said, oh, I know, I know that, that kid, Pat, is you know, kind of religious or whatever, and so she just decided to send me, to send me these books. And that, that action has blessed you, because I've gleaned things from those books that I've brought into messages and whatnot, and so don't ever underestimate you know, the gifts that you can give, the, of course, the prayers that you can give the influence that you can have. I mean, this is just so important, the influence that you can have in, in young people. I've heard it said that the, the words that you speak to your children or grandchildren, the ones you have influence over, the words that you speak over and over and over again, how many of you speak the same thing over and over and over and over again into your grandkids or your kids? That is going to be the voice of their conscience when they're an adult. They're going to hear that voice in their head. So make sure you're speaking scripture. You know, God loves you. Just whatever, whatever the Lord would give you. I, I hear in my mind every time I leave the room, turn the light off. 
I, every time I leave a room, I turn the light off because that was drilled into me when I was a kid. Anyhow, we could, we could go on about that. It's so important. One moment you could create in their life that could change their destiny. They'd look back on 20, 40 years from now and remember some truth about Jesus. So don't shy away from the Lord. Make sure you're making them cookies and blessing them, but give them those notes, those encouragements. God can change that life. And then if you're still there in 2 Timothy, look over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3.15, where it says, And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Isn't that great? Timothy knew from, from childhood, he knew the scriptures. Because Lois and Eunice were faithful to read the scriptures to him. Get God's word into your children and grandchildren. Just get God's word into it. Doesn't mean you have to, you know, quote chapter and verse just speak the truth of god's word over and over into their life whatever god's speaking to you in your devotions maybe write a verse or two down you know say it a couple times to yourself maybe write it on a card or text it to yourself whatever it might be and then later on in the day you speak that word into those to whom you have influence all right so paul there in lystra he he sees timothy and acts chapter 16 verse 3 uh, says that Paul wanted Timothy to go with him. And there it is, the beginning of Timothy's calling as a young man. This invitation from Paul would change the trajectory of Timothy's life. This would become his vocation. This would become his life, hanging out with the Apostle Paul and working. Timothy became one of Paul's greatest assets in ministry. He's mentioned 24 times in the New Testament, Paul refers to Timothy as his fellow worker, as his brother, as his bondservant. Uh, he calls him a beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He calls him his son. He, uh, in 1 Corinthians 16, he mentions that he's co-equal in the Lord's work. But of all the references to Timothy... In the New Testament, my favorite is in Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 20. I've mentioned this here before, but I'm going to read these verses here to you. It says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. And so here's something very important about Timothy. He was more concerned about other people than about himself. He was more concerned about the agenda of Jesus than his own interests. What a great guy. What a selfless, Jesus-focused individual. Give us a few Timothys, and we will proclaim God's love, and we will serve others. Lord, make me a Timothy. I mean, this is great. This is a fantastic thing to do with your children or with your grandkids. You, um, you have two of them, and you have one of them do something for the other one. Hey, look, what, what are they interested in? Do something for them. Bless them. I've even told my kids at times, um, I've said, he is more important than you. I've said that to my children. Maybe I'm a bad dad. But, but I've said, you need to treat him as if they're more important than you. And then I'll say to the other one, and he is more important than you. And you need to treat them as if they're more important. What I'm trying to develop Timothy's, right? That they're thinking more about others. Boy, this is hard, though. <laughs> Because we have so much selfishness right inside of us. We're so concerned about ourselves. And so, and, and even as adults, obviously we are. But, but just to be selfless and to be thinking, what can I do to bless others? How can I look into someone else's life, look into what's going on in them, and how can I help them? How can I serve them? That's a mark of maturity. That's the mark of maturity. 
All right, so back to 1 Timothy. So 1 and 2 Timothy, and then the next, the next book after 2 Timothy is called Titus. And these are commonly called the pastoral epistles. Now, they weren't really called the pastoral epistles really until the 18th century. Um, but they are written uh, to these overseers of churches. Um, and th they're, they're different than many of Paul's letters because they're not written to a church, but they're written to an individual. And so Timothy, um, when you look at Acts and you look at the epistles, you know that Timothy helped Paul establish the churches in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth. Timothy ministered with Paul throughout Macedonia and Achaia. Timothy was with Paul in Rome. And eventually, Timothy winds up in Ephesus. And so he is uh, overseeing the ministry there in Ephesus when Paul writes this letter. So this is being sent to Timothy when he was in Ephesus. Uh, and so Paul is helping Timothy. He's coaching him. He's giving him advice. He's telling him what his priority should be as a pastor. And so if you are interested in Christian leadership, First uh, and Second Timothy and Titus are great, great books. This gives us certain priorities. How should things be within a church? So when we think about the purpose of the letter, very simply, the main purpose uh, here in 1 Timothy is for Paul to provide encouragement, wise counsel, and support. So Paul is providing encouragement, he's providing wise counsel, and he's providing support. But if we break that down a bit, there are several issues that Paul addresses in this book. One is false teaching. You're going to see a few sections in the book that helps Timothy deal with false teachers that are coming into the church. When Paul was in Ephesus, he was passing through on his way to Jerusalem. He went through Ephesus and he called all the leaders of Ephesus to meet him. And he had a little mini conference there, a little mini retreat with the Ephesian elders. And this is what he told them. Uh, it's recorded in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 to 30. It says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. So Paul is saying there, he says, I know that people are going to come into the church with bad motives and with agendas to draw people away from truth and to disrupt and cause division. So Paul knew this was going to happen. So when he later then is, is writing to Timothy, he's going to give Timothy instructions about uh, this particular situation in the church. Also in 1 Timothy, there's important sections about prayer, about worship, about choosing leaders, about modesty, about money. But the, the two verses that really sum up that I think are the key to understanding 1 Timothy are found in chapter 3. Look, look with me there. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 where Paul says, and I'm reading this in the NIV version, it says, although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And so that phrase there in verse 15, so that you'll know how people ought to conduct themselves. You'll know how people ought to behave. You'll know how people ought to manage themselves, how they should act within the context of a church, of being God's church. So that's what 1 Timothy is all about, so that Timothy now can know how to help people act, how to help them manage themselves, how to help them act within the church environment, how to relate to others. So the main idea I've written is this. Paul writes to encourage Pastor Timothy to fight the good fight of leading the church and leading himself, leading the church and leading himself. Uh, chapter one, here's an outline of the book. Chapter one is a personal exhortation and encouragement. Chapters two and three is how to lead the church. And chapters four to six is how to lead yourself, how to lead the church and how to lead yourself, the ministry and the minister. And so let's look at chapter one, this personal exhortation and encouragement.
Paul gives a greeting in the first three verses, or the first two verses. And then verse 3 to 11, he's talking about bad teaching. Uh, not necessarily bad quality, but incorrect teaching, false teaching, teaching in verse 3 that is contrary to the, the, the truth, teaching that has no real purpose, teaching uh, that does not help people live a life of faith in God. In the New Living Translation, at the end of verse 4, Paul says, these things only lead to meaningless speculations which don't help people live a life of faith in God. And so this is the purpose of teaching, biblical teaching. Whenever you listen to a sermon, whenever you listen to a Bible teaching, whatever church you go to, the teaching should help you live a life of faith in God. If the teaching is not helping you live a life of faith, and obviously that's very broad, and there can be many different nuances and many different aspects to that, but if it's just a meaningless ramble, then it's not helping you. It's not, it's not good teaching. And look at Paul's purpose. In verse 5, he says, The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. And so, so Paul wants people to be filled with love. And this is what good Bible teaching should do. It should help you walk with Christ, live a life of faith. It should help you grow in love. Uh, verse 6 mentions that some people have missed the point. Um, Paul here doesn't specifically nail down the actual content of the false teachers, but he does associate it with the law. We see that in verse 7 uh, through verse 11 where he's mentioning the law. It says they want to be known as teachers of of the law. And we're talking here about the Jewish law. Paul lets Timothy know in this section that the law is good when it's used correctly. Uh, the law, which are all the rules found in the Old Testament, 613 laws in the Old Testament, Paul says the law is good because it shows us our need for obedience. Because you look at all of these rules, you look at all of these laws, and you say, I can't obey them. I need help. And that's what the law is supposed to do. It's supposed to point you to Christ, point you to somebody who has obeyed the law. And in this passage here, Paul is saying the law is for people who are rebellious. The law is for the lawbreaker. The law is for people who are doing wrong things so that they understand their guilt. They understand that they've done wrong. And so evidently, the false teaching that was coming into the church uh, it could have been that they were requiring people to obey the law. You have to follow all of the rules. If you don't follow the rules, you're not saved. So maybe it was something like that. But at any rate, it seems that these people were trying to make a name for themselves. They were more concerned about their own reputations and getting uh, notoriety than they were about the people of God. And verses 12 to 17 is a beautiful section where, where Paul reflects back upon what God has done in his life. He says in verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me faithful. He considered me trustworthy. He's appointed me to serve him. And so he's just, he's just reflecting upon this. In verse, verse 13, he mentions his former way of life, how he used to blaspheme Christ, how he used to persecute the church. Uh, and then he says in verse 12, um, I'm sorry, in verse 13, he says, I was a formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Verse 14 says, and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant. The grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant. His grace can forgive anyone with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. I love the New Living Translation of verse 14. It says, oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Jesus Christ. Then verse 15, he, he uh, offers this faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am the chief. Do you ever think of the Apostle Paul as the chief sinner? However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. 
And then, and then this just natural flow of praise where Paul says in verse 17, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor, glory forever and ever. Amen. Don't you love that? As Paul is sharing a little bit of his testimony, he becomes so thankful and elated that, that he just has this outburst of praise. I'm so thankful. Praise you, God, for saving me and rescuing me. And then interestingly, verse 18 has some, some type of prophecy was spoken over Timothy that prepared him for ministry. And Paul reminds him of that, reminding him of his clear call to the Lord, the call that he had received. Remember that, Timothy. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battle. And, uh, and then uh, he says something that is really important for us to, to latch on to here. And that is, um, in verse 19, he says, um, Keep your conscience clear, for some people have deliberately violated their conscience. So your conscience, right? Your conscience is a gift that God has given you. You know what your conscience is when you do something and you know what's wrong, right? It just kind of knocks on your heart. Oh, no, I, this is wrong. You have that conviction. That's your conscience. It's a gift from the Lord. And so if you're violating your conscience, you should stop, step back and say, okay, I don't want to violate my conscience because it says here that uh, these two individuals here, Hymenaeus and Alexander, that they violated their conscience and as a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. You know, so you violate your conscience once. Okay, yeah, you know, we can kind of correct that, bring it back, understand it. But over and over again, uh, some, if you continue to violate your conscience, it'll become seared. So now what used to cause you concern is of no concern at all because you're so used to violating your conscience. And that eventually could lead to shipwrecking your faith. And you don't want to do that. All right, so that's Paul's uh, introduction. And then the next two chapters, he's talking about how to lead the church. And uh, not by accident, very appropriately, he begins with prayer. I urge you, first of all, to pray, to pray. In any plan of ministry, there must be a priority of prayer. I exhort you, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. All these different types of prayers must be made for all men, for kings, all who are in authority, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And so Paul tells us that prayer is so important. To pray for our government officials, for those that are in ruling over us, that we should pray for them. But Let's draw the line from, uh, I don't mean draw a line in the sand. I meant like a line that connects verses 1 and 2. And it's good in verse 3. But why does Paul think that we should have a quiet and peaceable life? I think it's tied to verse 4 where Paul says, God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. I love that verse. God wants all people to be saved. It's very clear. And so it seems to me that the goal for this quiet and peaceable life is so that we would have the freedom to share the gospel, religious freedom, so that we don't, we don't want the, the government bugging us and putting all this stuff on us that's going to prevent the gospel from going forth. So Paul says, pray for them so, so that we could have this peaceful life, this uninterrupted life, so that we can focus on the gospel. So it's, it's, uh, it's very, very powerful. Uh, and then uh, there's this powerful statement about the deity of Christ in verse 5. There's one God and one mediator between man and God, the one who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom. This is the message God gave us. God gave the world at just the right time. So interesting, right? He talks about God wants all people to be saved. And then he says, okay, here's, here's who Jesus is. He's the one that reconciles God with humanity. So he's, he's connecting all of this together. And then he goes right back to prayer in, uh, in verse, uh, let me see. He talks about how he's been chosen as a preacher, an apostle. Uh, and then in verse 8, he goes right back to prayer. I want men to pray with holy hands, lifted up to God. Um, 
free from anger and controversy. So this is fascinating to me. When you, th when you say, let's pray, do you ever do this? No, what do we do? We bow our heads and close our eyes and fold our hands, but yet nowhere in the Bible does it say when you pray, you should bow your head and close your eyes. Some very wise Sunday school teacher told all her children some years and years ago, this is my speculation, okay, boys and girls, it's time to pray, so let's bow our heads, let's close, let's fold our hands. Why? Because if kids aren't folding their hands, they're going to be touching the kids next to them, right? Uh, but yet the Bible never says we should fold our hands. It doesn't say you can't, so it's not wrong to do it. But if we want to be biblical, we should raise our hands to pray, right? All right. And, uh, and Paul says, free from anger and controversy. Men, those are two things men are really good at. Anger and controversy. Right? We can, we can create controversy, and we sure know how to get angry. It's interesting. Paul says, guys, just don't be angry. Don't forget about your controversy. Just lift up your hands and pray. And maybe Paul's saying they should lift up their hands so they're not, like, hitting each other <laughs> or, or, or bugging each other. But we need to be good at praying. And then, dum dum dum, uh, section on modesty. I want women to be modest in their appearance. All right. Um, so, well, I'm just going to read this here. It says, and this is the New Living Translation. This is the Bible I brought with me tonight. It says. I want women to be modest in their appearance. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing and not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or by wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothes. For women who claim to be devoted to God should make themselves attractive by the good things that they do. Okay. So, um, so in recent years there's been a lot of discussion in the Christian community about modesty and what has been called the purity culture. Are you guys aware of this? Have you heard these conversations? And, uh, and so there's been a lot of talk about this and um, I'm not going to, there's been a lot of discussion about modesty. Well, don't want to dig into that too much here, but I just want to point out that the Bible is pro modesty. Um, Matthew West, a Christian songwriter, has written some fantastic songs. A couple years ago, he wrote a song called Modest is Hottest. And it was a parody song. You know what I mean by parody? It was, it was like, it was just making, making fun, right? It was like a, a, a joke of a song. It was meant to get people laughing. Matthew West is good at these songs. He wrote a song called Quarantine Life, which was all about being locked up in covid you know, and there's lines in that song, oh, I never knew my wife was, wasn't blonde. And, you know, just kind of like just joking around uh, about, you know, taking showers and all of this. stuff. So he's just having fun. And so he wrote, the, and he's got two young daughters, and he wrote a song called Modest is Hottest and made a video about it and, you know, said that, you know, and in the video everybody's wearing turtleneck sweaters and talking about how, you know, this is what you should wear if you want to be modest and this is the good look for you and all of that. And the Christian community and the just blew up and he got so much backlash um, that after I think just two weeks he pulled the video took the song took the song off and issued a statement that was almost an apology about the song but the argument is that is that um, uh, that that you're you're focusing on the wrong thing that um, that women are not responsible for men's lust and that is true we're all responsible for our own sin um, and so young men need to learn to control their minds and control their hearts and control their bodies in ways that honor God and that women should not be looked upon as objects right objectification that 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 that, uh, you know, there's a difference between attraction and lust. And, and men, 
uh, just need to understand the right way to treat women and to look at women. And so, so the modesty and purity culture is a big issue in the church. But I, I took some time to look at some of these different um, videos that were talking about his song. You can't find the song anywhere today. Although I did, not too long ago, I did hear the song on our radio station. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm going to have him play it more. So I think it was a bit overreaction. Listen, we should be allowed to poke fun at things in our culture, right? We should be allowed to have conversations around these issues. And just because somebody gets mad, I mean, we, should, we should have a conversation. If you disagree, well, let's listen to my perspective. But I, but I, I, I read some of the, the talk about this song, what people were saying, watched a, a part of a video where, where they were talking about all of this. And nowhere did anybody say anything about 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 through 10. I mean, what does the Bible say? The Bible says, Paul says, I want women to be modest in their appearance. Now, obviously, this does not mean turtleneck sweaters. This does not mean that you can't dress in a nice way. But it means that you shouldn't be provocative. Do you understand? You shouldn't, uh, what Paul says here, you shouldn't draw attention to yourselves. And we could say the same things about, about guys, that we shouldn't, uh, and really the, 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 uh, the emphasis here is, you know, wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothes. You shouldn't dress in such a way that people know you're loaded. You know what I mean? Like with, with all the chains and, and just, just, you're drawing attention to yourself. It's okay to look nice. It's okay to wear makeup. It's okay to, to, you know, put some perfume or if you're a guy, put cologne. I mean, these, are, these things are fine, but the, the focus on Scripture here is, hey, let's just be modest. There's nothing wrong with modesty. All right, I may have gotten myself into trouble, um, but the point is, is that uh, women who claim to be devoted to God should make themselves attractive by the things that they do, not the way that they, the way that they look. But I want to be clear that men need not to look at women as objects or in a lustful manner whatsoever. And so women are not responsible for the sin of others. Um, all right, and then um, uh, verse 11 to 15 are some of the most controversial verses in the Bible. So we're just going to skip those and we'll jump right to chapter 3. No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that. Uh, so these verses relate to the topic of women in ministry, specifically women in leadership within the church. So, um, so let me just read them and then I'll, I'll point out a couple common interpretations. So let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Um, okay, so the first thing I want to say about this is that you should never base doctrine on a difficult passage of Scripture. Does that make sense? So you should never stand firm on, I believe this, and you're, you're, you're putting yourself in that position because of a passage that is a bit debatable. In other words, what do I mean by debatable? Well, there are Bible scholars, people that devote their lives to studying the Bible in its original languages. And these people love Jesus, and they're evangelical. They believe that Jesus died on the cross. He's the only way to God. And when, when, those, when there are scholars that have different views, then we should be a little bit careful to say, well, it's my way. My way is the right way. And your way is the wrong way. My interpretation is right, and your interpretation is wrong. So we have to be careful about 
how we're, um, the type of foundation we are giving our, our doctrine. So let me tell you a couple interpretations of this passage. One, uh, one is that some say that Paul was referring when he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over man, but to be in silence. And then verse 11, let a woman learn in silence and submission. One is that Paul was referring to a specific situation in Ephesus where women were interrupting the teaching. Um, and, and so if that's the case, then this does not necessarily apply in a current cultural context. Um, another interpretation is that this does apply to all believers at all times everywhere, that women are not permitted to teach or have authority over a man but to be in silence. But um, that can't be the interpretation because in the book of Acts, there are women prophets. Philip had daughters that prophesied. The Old Testament and the New, there are women that are speaking. And if a prophet's not speaking authoritatively for God, I don't know who is, right? So there are women that are speaking authoritatively for God, presumably to both men and women. So for Paul to say, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, it cannot, whatever it means, it can't mean that this applies to all contexts everywhere. Does that make sense? Some have used this passage to say, well, he goes back to Adam and Eve, and he says, Adam wasn't deceived, but women are deceived. And I've heard people say, women are more easily deceived than men. I've heard people say that, and I do not believe that is true. And I don't believe that that is a fair interpretation of this passage. I think many, many men <laughs> are deceived, especially those that are teaching that. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So, um, so the best way to interpret this, well, let me say, in my opinion, uh, that women and men both have distinct roles and important roles in the church. Um, I believe um, that the role of elder, which is the authority in the church, is reserved for men. Uh, now, I have good people that I know that disagree with that. And this is not... Um, this is not one of those issues to die for. Do you know what I mean? I've shared this with you before, right? There's some issues worth dying for, like the resurrection of Jesus. There's other issues worth um, debating. Uh, or there's other issues worth dividing for. Uh, this may be an issue worth dividing for. Um, and what I mean by that is that if, if um, a woman felt a calling to be a pastor, um, this would be a difficult church for that to take place in. Um, there's other churches that feel women, that women can be elders and can be teaching pastors. Um, but the way we see scripture is that we believe that that, that is a role that is for men. Um, again, it's not worth dying for. It's certainly worth discussing. And, uh, and there are wonderful godly people that see that differently. But that's, 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 where, that's where we land on that. All right. Um, let's see here. So when we get into chapter 3, um, that's where Paul lays out qualifications for church leaders, for elders and deacons. We're not going to read through these, but you, you'll notice that they all, most of them have to do with um, character. Um, not necessarily what we might call competence or skills, but character. Uh, and then you have um, the first verse there that says, if someone desires to be an elder, they desire a good thing, an honorable position. And the word here is episkopos. It could be bishop, elder, leader, overseer. Uh, these are the group that would be watching over, directing, caring for a church. And then when you get into um, verse 8, you have deacons. Uh, it's a different word there. It's the diakonos, which is those who care for the needs and livelihood of an assembly of believers. So more kind of get your hands dirty as opposed to overseeing. Um, 
All right, and then, uh, and then it, it talks about the deacons there. When you get to verse 14, we have this important passage that we read um, at, the, at the beginning about the purpose of Timothy. Notice it's right in the middle of the book. Wonderful description of the church there in verse 15. Uh, and then wonderful description of Jesus, the deity of Christ. He was revealed in the body Uh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, announced to the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up to the glory. And then the last three chapters is how to lead yourself. Paul's been talking about the organization and the relationships within the church. And now he, for the most part, deals with uh, Timothy as a person, as a servant, as a minister. And he starts, just like chapter one did, he starts with a warning against false teachers. And um, uh, he mentions what life will look like in the last days, how people will turn away from the Lord there in verse one and two. Uh, and then Paul's telling Timothy, you have to explain all of this to the church. Look at verse six. It says, explain these things. Verse 11 tells him to teach. Verse 13 tells him to read the scriptures, to encourage the believers to teach. Verse 16 says, keep a close watch on your teaching." Uh, 4.12 is a famous passage. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but be an example to the believers in what you say, the way you live, in your love, your faith, and purity. Uh, many, many sermons and teachings have been given to young people on, on that particular verse, these different areas in your life that you need to keep uh, watching. And I love, I love verse 15 where Paul tells them, you know, throw yourself into what you're doing. Give yourself completely. Uh, so that everyone will see your progress. And then chapter five uh, is all about Paul giving Timothy some practical advice of how to talk to people in different generations. Don't speak harshly to an older man. Speak to him respectfully. Treat younger men as brothers. Treat older women like you'd treat your mother. Treat younger women with all purity like you would your own sisters. And then uh, verse three all the way to 16 is talking about widows and specifically practical instructions for how to take care of the needy. Um, and, you know, there's relatively little in the Bible that tells us that the government should take care of needy people. Uh, really, it's the church's responsibility. But really, this passage here really says it's, it's also the family's responsibility. It says, but those who won't care for their relatives especially those in their own household, have denied the truth faith. Such people are worse than an unbeliever. So, so really the biblical way is that, that as families, we should take care of our family. And then the church should take care of people, but uh, not much in the Bible about the government or the state taking care of uh, those that have needs. Now, I'm glad that the government does. Um, but in this section, we also learn that there are certain qualifications Um, that we shouldn't just give out money or food to anyone without any regard to the situation. We are to be generous and helpful, but there's got to be some guidelines. And, uh, and we do have guidelines in place. Uh, verse 19 uh, talks about uh, accusation against leaders. That, uh, the, and the focus here is if a leader gets accused of something, make sure that there's more than one person that's accusing that leader. Uh, verse 21 talks about not showing favoritism, taking everyone seriously. Um, and verse 22 is important. It tells us not to appoint people to places in a hurry. We should take our time. And then, of course, stay pure. Paul tells Timothy, make sure you're being pure. Keep yourself pure. And then the last chapter has instructions for uh, slaves and for their masters. Uh, verse 2 talks about um, that we should teach and encourage obedience. Uh, verse 3, Paul says that we should encourage, uh, that, these, that teaching should promote a godly life. Remember, a, a lot in this book we talk about what's the purpose of biblical teaching, so that you'd grow in your faith, you'd grow in your love. Here we see that it, you'd live a godly life. Um, Uh, there's more warnings here about false teachers. And then a really important section here from verse 6 to verse 10, it talks about money, attitude towards money. And what Paul is saying here is godliness with contentment is great gain. 
Godliness with contentment is great gain. Being content with what you have. Not wanting the latest and the greatest. Is this a challenge for you? Just, it's hard to be content. You always want the, the newest gadget or the newest thing or the newest uh, whatever. Thinking that that'll bring you contentment. But Paul says wisely, we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of the world. As I've heard it said by several people, I've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. At, at one point, it's all going to be gone. Every time we've moved or every time we've rearranged things or cleaned things out, I've always thought about how much of my life is devoted to moving things you know, you pick this up and you put it there. Take this off and put that up. Take this, move this. We, it's our possessions. And yet our, lives, our life does not consist in the abundance of our possessions. We know that. And I wonder what would happen if we just took all of our possessions away. And what are we left with? Our relationship with the Lord. We brought nothing into the world. We can take nothing out of the world. Uh, Paul says... In, that people who want to be rich fall into a great trap. This is, I think this is really important for us in, in America because, because sometimes we can want more than what we have. Verse uh, 10 of chapter 6 is often misquoted. Have you ever heard somebody say money is the root of all evil? Well, this is where they get it from, and that's not true. I misquoted it. It says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So it's not money. Money's a great tool. Money's a fantastic tool. And, and a generous person with a pure heart that's not greedy, I think God will give that person a lot of money that they can use to advance the kingdom and, and be a blessing to others. I thank God for wealthy Christians. I thank God for wealthy Christian, for Christian millionaires or billionaires. And if you know of one that would like to help us build a new building, let them know that we thank God for them and we'll pray for them. But it's the love of money, the love of money that is a root of all kinds of evil. And Paul says here, some, of, some, of, some people have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. What language? Pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Do you love money? Be careful. Be careful. And then Paul's final instructions. Run from evil, pursue righteousness, live a godly life, seek after faith, love, perseverance, gentleness. And then uh, he comes back to money in verse 17. He says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but to trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. And so there's a good passage that God gives us things to enjoy. So it's okay to enjoy nice things. There's nothing wrong. You should not feel guilt for enjoying nice things. But make sure that you're doing good, that you're also rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for yourself a good foundation for the time to come. Uh, so that's First Timothy.